We're going to begin the class proper, um, Introduction to Psychology, with a discussion about the brain. And in particular, I want to lead off the class um, with an idea that the Nobel Prize winning biologist, Francis Crick, described as the astonishing hypothesis. And the astonishing hypothesis is summarized like this. As he writes, the astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will, are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. Um, it is fair to describe this as astonishing. It is an odd and unnatural view. And I don't actually expect people to believe it at first. It's an open question whether you'll believe it when this class comes to an end, but I'd be surprised if many of you believe it now. Most people don't. Most people, um, in fact, hold a different view. Most people are dualists. Now, dualism is a very different doctrine. It's a doctrine that can be found in every religion and in most philosophical systems uh, throughout history. It was very explicit in Plato, for instance. But the most articulate and well-known defender of dualism is the philosopher René Descartes. And René Descartes um, explicitly asked the question, are humans merely physical machines, merely physical things? And he answered no. He agreed that animals are machines. In fact, he called them beast machines and said animals, non-human animals, are merely robots. But people are different. There's a duality of people. Like animals, we possess physical material bodies. But unlike animals, what we are is not physical. We are immaterial souls that possess physical bodies, that, that have physical bodies, that reside in physical bodies, that connect to physical bodies. Um, so this is known as dualism because the claim is, for humans at least, there are two separate things. There's our material bodies and there's our immaterial minds. Now Descartes made two arguments for dualism. One argument um, involved observations about human action. So Descartes lived in a fairly sophisticated time and his time did have robots. These were not electrical robots, of course. They were robots powered by um, hydraulics. So Descartes would walk around the French royal gardens. And the French royal gardens were set up like a 17th century Disneyland. They had these characters that would operate according to water flow. And so if you stepped on a certain panel, a swordsman would jump out with a sword. If you stepped somewhere else, a bathing beauty would cover herself up behind some bushes. And Descartes said, boy, these machines respond in certain ways to certain actions. So machines can do certain things. In fact, he says, our bodies work that way too. If you tap somebody on the knee, your leg will jump out. Well, maybe that's all we are. But Descartes said that can't be. Because there are things that humans do that no machine could ever do. Humans are not limited to reflexive action. Rather, humans are capable of coordinated, creative, sponta spontaneous things. We can use language, for instance. And sometimes my use of language, it can be reflexive. Somebody says, how are you? And I say, I am fine, how are you? But sometimes, um, I could say what I choose to be. How are you? Pretty damn good. I can just choose. And machines, Descartes argued, are incapable of that sort of choice. Hence, we are not mere machines. The second argument is of course quite famous and this was the method, this, this he came to using the method of doubt. So he started asking himself the question, what can I be sure of? And he said, well, I believe there's a God, but honestly I can't be sure there's a God. I believe I live in a rich country, but maybe I've been fooled. He even said, I, I believe I have had friends and family but maybe I am being tricked. Maybe an evil demon, for instance, has tricked me, has deluded me into thinking I have experiences um, that aren't real. And of course, the modern version of this is the Matrix. 
the idea. The Matrix is explicitly built upon Cartesian Descartes' worries about an evil demon. Maybe everything you're now experiencing is not real, but rather is a product of some other, perhaps malevolent creature. Descartes similarly could, could doubt he has, he has a body. In fact, he noticed that madmen sometimes believe they have extra limbs, or they believe they're of different sizes and shapes than they really are. And Descartes said, how do I know I'm not crazy? I mean, crazy people don't think they're crazy, so the fact I don't think I'm crazy doesn't mean I'm not crazy. How do I know, Descartes said, I'm not dreaming right now? But there is one thing Descartes concluded that he cannot doubt. And the answer is he cannot doubt that he is himself thinking. That would be self-refuting. And so Descartes used the method of doubt to, to say there's something really different about having a body. That's always uncertain from having a mind. And he used this argument as a way to support dualism, as a, as a, a way to support the idea that bodies and minds are separate. And so he concluded, I knew that I was a substance, a whole essence or nature of which is to think, and that for its existence there is no need of any place, nor does it depend on any material thing. That is to say, the soul by which I am, what I am, is entirely distinct from body. Now, I said before that this is common sense, and I want to illustrate the common sense nature of this in a few ways. One thing is, our dualism is a mesh in our language. So we have a certain mode of talking about things that we own, or things that are close to us. My arm, my heart, my child, my car. But we also extend that to my body and my brain. We talk about owning our brains, as if we're somehow separate from them. Our dualism shows up in intuitions about personal identity. And what this means is that Common sense tells us that somebody can be the same person even if their body undergoes radical and profound changes. Um, the best examples of this are fictional. So we have no, under, no problem understanding a movie where somebody goes to sleep as a teenager and wakes up as Jennifer Garner, as an older person. Now, now nobody, nobody says, oh, that's a documentary, I believe that thoroughly true. <laughs> But at the same time, nobody, no adult, no teenager, no child ever leaves and says, I'm totally conceptually confused. Rather, we follow, <laughs> we, follow, we follow the story. We can also follow stories um, which involve more profound transformations, as when a man dies and is reborn into the body of a child. Now, you might have different views around, people around this room will have different views as to whether reincarnation really exists. But we can imagine it. We can imagine a person dying and then re-emerging in another body. This is not Hollywood invention. The, one of the great short stories of the last century begins with the sentence by Franz Kafka. As Gregor Samso woke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect. And again, Kafka in, invites us to imagine waking up into a body of a cockroach. And we can. This is also not modern. Hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, Homer described the fate of the companions of Odysseus who were transformed um, by a witch into pigs. Actually, that's not quite right. She didn't turn them into pigs, she did something worse. She stuck them in the bodies of pigs. They had the head and voice and bristles and body of swine, but their minds remained unchanged as before. So they were penned there, weeping. And we are invited to imagine the fate of, again, finding ourselves in the bodies of other creatures. And if you can imagine this, this is because you are imagining what you are as separate from the body that you reside in. We allow for the notion that many people can occupy one body. Um, this is a mainstay of some slapstick humor, including the classic movie, All of Me. Steve Martin, Lily Tomlin, highly recommended. But many people think this sort of thing really happens. One analysis of multiple personality disorder is that you have many people inside a single body fighting it out for control. Now we will discuss multiple personality disorder towards the end of the semester and it turns out things are a good deal more complicated than this. But still, my point isn't about how it really is, but how we think about it. Common sense tells us you could have more than one person 
inside a single body. This shows up in a different context involving exorcisms, where many belief systems allow for the idea that people's behavior, particularly their evil or irrational behavior, could be because something else has taken over their bodies. Finally, um, most people around the world, all religions and most people in most countries at most times, believe that people can survive the destruction of their bodies. Um, now, cultures differ according to the fate of the body. Some cultures have the body going to heaven, sorry, the fate of the soul. Some cultures have you going to heaven or descending to hell. Others have you occupy another body. Um, still others have you occupy an amorphous spirit world. But what they share is the idea that what you are is separable from this physical thing you carry around. And the physical thing um, that you carry around uh, can be destroyed while you live on. Um, these views are particularly common in the United States. Uh, in one survey done in Chicago a few years ago, people were asked their religion and then were asked what would happen to them when they died. Most people in the sample were Christian and about 96% of Christians said, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Some of the sample was Jewish. Now, Judaism is actually a religion with a less than clear story about the afterlife. Still, most of the subjects who identify themselves as Jewish said when they die, they will go to heaven. Um, some of the sample denied having any religion at all, said they have no religion at all. Still, when these people were asked what would happen when they would die, most of them answered, I'm going to go to heaven. <laughs> so, dualism is a mesh. It, 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 a lot rests on it. But as Crick points out, the scientific consensus now is that dualism is wrong. There is no you separable or separate from your body. In particular, there is no you separable from your brain. To put it the way cognitive scientists and psychologists and neuroscientists like to put it, um, the mind is what the brain does. The, br the mind reflects the workings of the brain, just like computation reflects the working of a computer. Now, why would you hold such an outrageous view? Why would you reject dualism in favor of this alternative? Well, a few reasons. One reason is, dualism has always had its problems. For one thing, it's a profoundly unscientific doctrine. We want to know, as curious people, how children learn language what we find attractive or unattractive. What's the basis for mental illness? And dualism simply says it's all non-physical as part of the ether and hence fails to explain it. More specifically, dualists like Descartes struggle to explain how a physical body connects to an immaterial soul. What's the conduit? How could this connection be made? After all, Descartes knew full well that you're, there is such a connection. You, you, your body obeys your commands. Um, if you bang your toe, stub your toe, you feel pain. If you drink alcohol, it affects your reasoning. But he could only wave his hands as to how this physical thing in the world could connect to an immaterial mind. Descartes, when he was alive, was reasonable enough concluding that physical objects cannot do certain things. He was reasonable enough in concluding, for instance, as he did, that there's no way a merely physical object could ever play a game of chess. Because, and that such a capacity is beyond the capacity of the physical world, and hence you have to apply, you have to extend explanation to an immaterial soul. But now we know, we have what, what scientists call an existence proof. We know physical objects can do complicated and interesting things. We know, for instance, machines can play chess. We know machines can manipulate symbols. We know machines have limited capacities to engage in mathematical and logical reasoning, um, to recognize things, to do various forms of computations. And this makes it at least possible that we are such machines. So one, you can no longer say, look, physical things just can't do that. Because we know physical things can do a lot. And this opens up the possibility 
that, that, that humans are physical things. In particular, that humans are brains. Finally, there is strong evidence that the brain is involved in mental life. Somebody who hold a, held a dualist view um, that said that what we do and what we decide and what we think and what we want are all have nothing to do with the physical world would be embarrassed by the fact that the brain seems to correspond in intricate and, and, and elaborate ways to our mental life. Um, now this has been known for a long time. Philosophers and psychologists knew for a long time that getting smacked in the head could change your mental faculties, that diseases like syphilis could make you deranged, that chemicals like caffeine and alcohol can affect how you think. But what's new is we can now in different ways see the direct effects of mental life. Somebody with a severe and profound loss of mental faculties, the deficit will be shown correspondingly in her brain. Um, studies using imaging techniques like CAT scans, PET, and fMRI illustrate that different parts of the brain are active at, during different parts of mental life. For instance, um, the difference between seeing words, hearing words, reading words, and generating words can correspond to different aspects of what part of your brain is active. To some extent, if we put you in an fMRI scanner and observe what you're doing in real time, by looking at the activity patterns in your brain, we can tell whether you're thinking about music or thinking about sex. To some extent, we can tell whether you're solving a moral dilemma versus something else. And this is no surprise if what we are is the workings of our, of our physical brains. But it is extremely difficult to explain um, if one is a dualist. Now, so what you have is the scientific consensus is that all of mental life, including consciousness and emotions and choice and morality, are the products of brain activities. So you would expect that when you rip open the skull and look at the brain, you'd see something glorious. You'd see like, I don't know, a big shiny thing with glass tubes and blinding lights and, and sparks and wonderful colors. And actually though, the brain is just disgusting. Um, it looks like, like an old meatloaf. It's, um, it's, it's gray when you take it out of the head. It's called gray matter. But that's just because it's out of the head. Inside the head is bright red because it's pulsing with blood. It doesn't even taste good. Um, well, has, has anybody here ever eaten brain? I mean, it's good with cream sauce, but everything's good with cream sauce. So, so, so the question is, how can something like this give rise to us? And, I mean, you have to have some sympathy for, for Descartes. There's another argument Descartes could have made that's a lot less subtle than the ones he did make, which is that thing responsible for free will and love and consciousness? Ridiculous. What I want to do, and what, what the goal of, of neuroscience is, is to make it less ridiculous. To try to explain how the brain works. How the brain can give rise to thought. And what I want to do today is take a first stab at this question. Um, but it's something we'll continue to discuss throughout the course as we talk about different aspects of mental life. What I want to do though now is provide a big picture. So I want to do is start off small with the smallest interesting part of the brain and then get bigger and bigger and bigger. Talk about how the small part of the brain the neurons, the basic building blocks of thought, combine to other mental structures and then to different subparts of the brain and finally to the whole thing.